she would change the tone of her voice. Like in all of the speeches that she gave, she's speaking in this really deep, dirt, burr tone voice. I can't even do it. I can't even do it. Hello beautiful people, it's me Sydney. Thank you so much for clicking to watch this video. Today we're going to be doing another episode of Makeup and History. Makeup history. Makeup and history. Hey, Makeup. Sorry, I don't know. I think that's the theme song. We'll work on it. We'll work on it a little bit more. This is officially going to be a series on my channel. I so greatly appreciate all the love and support that you guys have shown me on my last two videos. It means so, so much to me because I thoroughly enjoyed making those videos and creating this type of content. So to have it be so well received is just amazing. It's really nice. So thank you guys so much. Last week we talked about Rachel Dolezal, who was the woman who identified as black but was actually a white woman and shocked the nation when everyone found out. Today we're going to be talking about the inventor. I'm using Using air quotes because you'll find out why I'm using air quotes. Today we're going to be talking about Elizabeth Holmes, who in my mind is one of the mm, greatest con artists we've ever seen. A true, a true scammer. Scammer. Please feel free to fact check me in the comments below. If I mess anything up or I forget to say anything, please feel free to include any additional information. And if you haven't already, subscribe! Come on in for this hug! <laughs> I had a comment actually last week. Someone said, how dare you try to hug me during a pandemic? That was really funny. I really laughed about that. Good one. Good one. But yes, subscribe and turn on the notification bell so that you can get notified every time I upload. And if you've never heard this story before, then buckle up, baby! You're in for a treat! True. Sorry. Let me just tell the story. Let's just start the video. Jesus. I'm gonna zoom in just a little bit closer so you guys can see what I'm doing with the makeup better. As usual, all of the products that I'm using will be down in the description box below if you're curious. And let's just jump on in. If you're unfamiliar with who Elizabeth Holmes is, she was the founder of a company called Theranos, which was going to revolutionize the blood testing industry as we know it. The word Theranos was a combination of the words therapy and diagnose. Yes, therapy and diagnose, Theranos. And the whole premise of the company was to make blood testing more affordable, easier, and you were only going to have to supply one drop of blood. That was the big thing with the company. Only one drop of blood would be necessary to run like 200 tests or something crazy like that. Now, the reason that this idea was so revolutionary was because anyone who's ever given blood knows that you have to give a su substantial amount of blood. They have to use these really large needles and stick them in your veins and you know, to sit there and let them take out the blood and then they send the blood to the lab testing facility to get tested and they have to send the results back to your doctor and then your doctor will tell you the results of your of your blood test. At the time that Elizabeth had the idea for Theranos there was only two major blood testing labs a company called LabCorps and a company called Quest. Now this is not uncommon in our free market in America, there's usually like two to five companies that pretty much monopolize every category, every industry, and they take over. So a lot of healthcare professionals didn't love Quest and LabCorps because they were very expensive. There was a lot of lawsuits against them from health insurance companies because they were overcharging. They weren't transparent with the results or how they got the results. So for Elizabeth to come out of nowhere seemingly and say, hey, I'm going to make a blood testing system where you only have to give one drop of blood, it'll run 200 tests, and you're gonna get the results super quick. So everyone's like, oh sh That's a good idea. That's an excellent idea. I like this idea. Theranos was going to completely revolutionize the healthcare industry as we know it, and provide more accessible blood testing for everyday people. So in 2014, Theranos was worth $9 billion billion with a B. Everyone who heard about Theranos wanted to invest in it because it was a good idea. People were practically throwing money at her. Some of the wealthiest, most respected people in this country wanted to invest in Theranos and she even had a really interesting board of directors. The board of directors consisted of all former secretaries of state for the United States, like official secretaries of states. Her board was made up of some of the biggest names in history. George Schultz, the I think that was her first connection. The former Secretary of State, the guy who many people credit with winning the Cold War. They also included generals of the military, of the Navy. Your board uh, looks like you guys are ready to take over the world, not uh, start a medical device company. People thought it was strange that there were no like scientists or doctors on her medical board, but people respected the idea of the company. And then when they saw the board of directors, they were like, oh, wow, okay, maybe this is, this is a real thing. Like. 
take all my money. Elizabeth herself was regarded as a genius. Someone actually referred to her as the Beethoven of our time. What Elizabeth Holmes' gift was, was she was able to take older white men who were incredibly successful at one point in their careers and wrap them around her finger. They thought she was really smart. They thought it was impressive that she was a woman in a male-dominated industry. She was this really well-known figure in Silicon Valley, which is known to be pretty much dominated by men. There are women in Silicon Valley, but for the most part, it's a lot of dudes in Silicon Valley. So in 2014, Elizabeth is receiving a lot of recognition. She's getting covers of very reputable magazines and publications. Everyone thought she was the greatest Thing living. Turns out she was full of <laughs> Who knew? <laughs> Sorry. So you must be asking like, what happened? What happened? Theranos is a good idea. Everyone loves Elizabeth. So what happened? Why was she full of shit, Sydney? Tell us. I'm gonna tell you. All right, you guys. So let's get in our time machine and travel back to 1984. We're here. We're in 1984. February 3rd, 1984 in Washington, DC. Elizabeth is born to parents Noel Ann and Christian Holmes. Both of Elizabeth's parents worked in the government. Her mom was a congressional committee staffer and and her dad worked in various human rights organizations. Elizabeth went to high school in Texas though, and her parents describe her as a very driven, goal-oriented kid. They said she was always interested in being a leader. She was extremely driven and very studious. At a young age, she was asked by relatives, what do you want to do when you grow up? And uh, she answers immediately, I want to be a billionaire. And the relative says, don't you want to be president? And she says, no, the president will marry me because I'll have a billion dollars. Straight up, Elizabeth was about that money. Now, I don't know how true that is or not, but the idea wasn't super far off for their family because although they were a family with wealth, they weren't poor by any means. Elizabeth's great, 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 great grandfather was a man named Charles Fleshman, Fleshman, and Charles built an enormous amount of wealth in the 1940s creating a yeast business. He was one of the richest people in the country at the time. He accumulated an amount of wealth that today would have been worth a billion dollars. The younger generation squandered the money, however, so they weren't currently billionaires at the time that Elizabeth said she wanted to be a billionaire, but you get what I'm saying. It wasn't like unheard of for the family. Elizabeth wanted to be an entrepreneur just like her grandfather was, her great, 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 great-grandfather. Elizabeth claims that she began her first entrepreneurship venture in high school where she was selling C++ compliers to Chinese universities. I have absolutely no idea what a C++ complier is, but she was proficient in Mandarin and she began a company where she was selling that to Chinese universities, I guess. And then in 2001, she attended Stanford University and here is where her ideas truly began to flourish. So in 2002, Elizabeth sought mentorship from a woman named Phyllis Gardner, who was a professor of medicine at Stanford, but Phyllis also had a lot of experience in business and creating companies. So Elizabeth goes to Phyllis and tells her that she has this idea for a skin patch that can detect illnesses. The idea is literally like a patch that you put on your skin that will somehow be able to detect if you're ill or something. I don't, I don't know. Phyllis tells her that that idea is scientifically impossible. It's just not going to work. She's like, sorry, Liz, it's not going to work. Skin is too strong. It's just, it's scientifically impossible. So I said, I, Liz, but that's fun, but I don't think that's going to work. And I know because I'm a professor of medicine at Stanford. So sorry. So Elizabeth leaves and comes back with a new idea. This time her idea is that she's going to create a machine that will be able to run diagnostic tests. She explains to Phyllis her idea and how the machine would work. She even shows her like a mock-up of what it's going to look like and all this stuff. She's super excited. And Phyllis is still sitting there like, girl, that is impossible. It's impossible. It's not going to work. She came back twice, I think. And I just really I try to help students, but I just felt like I can't help you. You're not listening. Phyllis is basically crushing Elizabeth's dreams again. And Elizabeth's like, okay, Phyllis, you know what? Maybe you're just a hater, Phyllis. This is gonna work. Phyllis is like, it's not gonna work. Get out of my office. I don't, I don't know if she said that. So Elizabeth still really firmly believes in her idea. She thinks Phyllis is just being a hater. So she goes to find a new mentor. This time she goes and talks to the head of the science department at Stanford, a man named Channing Robertson. She tells Channing her idea and Channing's like, wow, wow. Channing's mind is blown. He's like, damn girl, that's a good idea. You got a good idea right there. 
I've taught thousands of students at Stanford, and I knew right away that I was dealing with something very, very different. Channing believes in her idea so much that he leaves his position as head of the science department at Stanford, his tenured position, to go and work for Elizabeth and help her create this company. He's like, F yeah, Elizabeth, I don't need retirement. I don't need this. Let's go build this company. And keep in mind, at this point, there is no evidence that this is going to work. There's been no tests. There's there's nothing. It's literally just an idea. But he believes in the idea so much. He believes in Elizabeth so much that he leaves his job to go and help her build this company. So in 2003, at the age of 19, Elizabeth drops out of Stanford and starts her company, Theranos. She joins the famous list of dropouts, Mark Zuckerberg, Bill Gates, Steve Jobs, all of these people who are like huge names in Silicon Valley, all dropped out of their Ivy League schools and then became billionaires. So she's like, yeah, me too. I'm gonna do that too, me next. Elizabeth starts pitching her idea for Theranos all around Silicon Valley so she can get investments and get money so she can start, you know, building the company. She creates this story behind Theranos that her uncle was diagnosed with skin cancer when she was younger. And before they knew it, the skin cancer had grown really rapidly in his body and he died. And had he been able to diagnose himself earlier, he possibly could have gotten the treatment that he needed to live. Theranos was going to provide the accessibility for people to be able to diagnose themselves earlier so that they didn't have to die. So the mission statement behind Theranos was creating early diagnosis so that no one has to say goodbye too soon. That was the tagline, say goodbye too soon. Elizabeth would say this all the time. People go through when they say goodbye too soon. I build a world in which you don't have to say goodbye too soon. A world in which people don't have to say goodbye too soon. Say goodbye too soon. I'm creating Theranos so no one has to say goodbye too soon. And investors were just eating it up. They loved it. They were like, amazing. This is an amazing idea. You're going to change the game, girl. Here's my money. Take all of my money. Do it. Please. Take it. Take it. Take it. And these weren't like dumb people. They weren't like super gullible, unreasonable people. They were really smart, really rich people who had a lot of money and just believed in what Elizabeth was doing. They thought it was an excellent idea. So they gave her hell of money. They gave her a lot of money. So by 2005, just two years after founding Theranos, Elizabeth had raised over $6 million in investments. Six million dollars with no evidence. There was still no proof. Literally, people were just giving her money based on the idea. Elizabeth was also a really well-known admirer of Steve Jobs. Like, she loved Steve Jobs. She wouldn't admit it, but she, she loved Steve Jobs. She even started wearing the same thing every day like Steve Jobs famously did. So she began actively poaching employees from Apple. A couple of the employees who came to work for her were Avi Tavanian, who was the head of software at Apple, and Anna Ariola, Ar 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 I don't know how to say that, but I will put it on the screen. And she was responsible for designing the iPhone. Anna even admits that she left like 15,000 shares at Apple to come work for Theranos. And this is in 2005, like 2005, 2006, mind you, before the iPhone blew up. So she didn't know that the iPhone was gonna be the iPhone. She leaves 15,000 shares at Apple. Good on her for not ending it all because I don't know if I could walk around seeing everyone using an iPhone knowing I designed it and what do I, sh what do I have to show for it? <laughs> But I digress. So once Avi and Anna started working for Elizabeth, they started to have suspicions that she was full of shit. Theranos was divided in two sides. There was the marketing side that was responsible for creating buzz around the company. And then there was the science side that was responsible for creating the product that Elizabeth was going around saying that was gonna be a thing. So on the marketing side, Elizabeth was a genius and she was revered. Everyone thought she was the greatest thing since sliced bread. But on the science side, they were like, I don't know if this is gonna work. I don't, I don't know. <laughs> Avi and Anna both end up leaving because they realize that the technology isn't really working. And they also notice that the company is engaging in unethical practices. Other employees would also say that Theranos had a very toxic work culture. It was very secretive. No one trusted each other. If you didn't work directly with someone, you didn't talk to them. Like it was just a very uncomfortable, toxic work environment. So in 2009, Elizabeth starts running out of money and she's like, I need more money. 
I need more money. That's when she meets a man called Sonny Balwani. Now, Sonny Balwani loans Elizabeth $13 million, and he also becomes the COO and the president of Theranos. Initially, everyone was really confused why he was given such a prominent position. He did loan her a lot of money, but why, why did he have to be the president for loaning her a lot of money? He didn't have any experience in the medical industry. He didn't have any engineering or science experience. So they were like, why? Why is this guy the president now? What the fuck? The other employees also just didn't like Sonny at all. They said he had a very menacing presence. He was a bully. He wasn't nice. He just had bad vibes. Like, Sonny was just bad vibes. I always felt like Sonny was making a deal. To him, this was another home run that he was gonna hit. Then, it became apparent that Sonny and Elizabeth were dating each other. They had a relationship. And they didn't openly admit this, but people became suspicious because they were always leaving work together and showing up to work together and just spending a lot of time together in general. They were like, oh, okay, we get it now. Now we know why he's the president, because, uh, He's your main squeeze. And not to judge, but they are a very odd looking couple. I don't, no judgment, so. Get it how you live, Liz. So in 2010, Sonny and Elizabeth start pitching Theranos to companies for potential partnerships. They now had a prototype for the box, which they called the Edison, after another famous inventor, Thomas Edison. And although the technology of Edison still didn't work, they signed a contract with Walgreens and they were going to roll out the Edison in Walgreens stores in 2013. So Sonny and Elizabeth assumed that they still had time to make the technology work. This was in 2010, so they had three years to get the Edison to work. Easy. Behind closed doors, the Edison was a hot mess. It was a hot ass mess. It was constantly breaking. There were spills in the machine. So they're testing blood samples and blood is getting all over the place. And the engineers are having to be really, really careful not to touch any of the samples. A lot of the blood samples that they were getting were from donors, people on the street really, who just needed money. So they were participating in these studies. They don't know what potential diseases these people have and they're just splattering all over the machines. Because Theranos was a private company, they were not required to share with investors how the technology worked or let anyone else inspect the technology if they didn't work at Theranos. So when investors would come visit Theranos or they had new investors that they were trying to get to invest in Theranos, they would have them put their blood samples in the machine, like they would take a drop of blood, put it in the machine, and then they would leave the room, have a scientist come in, take the blood samples out, go down to the laboratory, run the test manually, and then put the samples back in the machine before they came back to see their results. So they were just straight up lying to anyone who came and thought that the Edison was working. It was no longer an option of trying to get it to work or seeing if it would work. They signed a contract with Walgreens under the premise that it was already working. So they had to make it work. Anytime any of the engineers or scientists would go to Elizabeth or Sonny and say like, hey, I don't know, I don't know if this is gonna work, they would be fired or scolded or reprimanded in some way. So many people were afraid to talk to her or tell her. They also started noticing that she may have been a pathological liar. One of the ex-employees said that he emailed her a question and she emailed back saying, okay, I'll get to this when I get back to the office because I've already gone home for the day. But then he looks over and he can see See her in another office emailing him back and he's like why would you lie about leaving if you hadn't left already you could just say that you'll get to it late why would sketch is f so the scientists and engineers at theranos are just chugging along trying to get the technology to work and finally in 2013 the head scientist at theranos a man named ian gibbons starts freaking out because it's 2013 now like they're about to launch with walgreens any minute and the edison is still not working ian had been with the company since 2005 basically since the very start and of course he was very very excited about joining the company the first experienced scientist hired by theranos he was an expert in blood testing and had done much of the work on the company's key patents to which elizabeth had attached her name ian was a cambridge phd he knew things the rest of us didn't know everyone assumed that if someone was going to get the edison to work it was going to be ian gibbons so from 2005 to 2013 he became increasingly distraught at the fact that it wasn't working. Like, it just wasn't gonna work. He was also getting really worried and depressed at the direction that the company was going in because he noticed that Elizabeth had been committing a lot of fraud and lying, and that just wasn't the kind of guy he was. He was a very honest, hardworking guy. 
So he was just, he was really uncomfortable. Every time he would go to Elizabeth or Sonny and voice his concerns, as the head scientist of the company, he would get scolded. They would threaten to fire him. They started treating him increasingly worse and worse and using a lot of like bullying psychological tactics like moving his office, getting rid of his office altogether, just being very mean. The final straw for Ian came when he was asked to testify on behalf of Theranos that the technology was working, basically. Theranos was in a patent lawsuit where they needed him to provide his expertise on what the company was and what the technology was. And at this point, his relationship with Elizabeth was already really terrible. He said she would bully him all the time, she would make him feel really bad, and the company wasn't what they were claiming it to be, like the technology didn't work. So his only options were to either testify on behalf of Theranos and basically lie and perjure himself in court, or admit in court that Theranos was lying and that they were fraud and that the technology didn't actually work and risk losing his job. Or if he chose not to testify at all, Elizabeth threatened to fire him. Ian's wife said that he was very distraught over the whole situation. He didn't want to quit the company and then risk being unemployed after spending nine years working on this product, but he also wasn't willing to lie. So he decided to commit suicide, which is so sad. I just imagine Ian was just like a really nice guy who just really wanted to work on the product and got involved with Sonny and Elizabeth who treated him terribly. It feels really inappropriate to be putting on eyeliner while I'm talking about someone's suicide. Hold on, I'm gonna put on my lashes and then I'll be right back. All right, so lashes and liner are done. Ian Gibbons commits suicide because he doesn't wanna lie, but he also doesn't wanna risk getting fired and having to start his life over. It's really sad actually, it's super unfortunate. When Ian's wife contacts Theranos to let them know what's happened to Ian, they don't send any condolences, they don't show up to the funeral, they don't offer to pay for the funeral. All they do is send her a request to get back any and all confidential information that Ian might have had about Theranos. That's it. I brought back his documents that he had at home and left them at the front desk. Did you ever hear from Elizabeth Holmes again? No. No call from Elizabeth, nothing. So in September of 2013, Walgreens and Theranos announced that they're going to be working together. The Edison still doesn't work. The technology at Theranos still isn't working, but they move ahead as planned anyway. Theranos creates this really captivating marketing campaign, a commercial with real consumers who talk about their experience with blood testing and talk about how Theranos would really help them to make blood testing more accessible. There are so many people that don't have insurance and can't afford insurance. I was going to doctors and I couldn't afford it. I was paying out of pocket. It's ridiculous. It's this really captivating commercial about Theranos. And of course, Elizabeth is in it and everyone's like, oh my God, thank God this woman has invented such an amazing thing. This is amazing. So the commercial creates more publicity for Theranos. And because they have now partnered with Walgreens, they get a heap of new investors and lots and lots of money. Some of the new investors at Theranos included the Walton family who created the little known company we know as Walmart. Just the little tiny store Walmart, little tiny chain. The Walton family is one of the richest families in the US and they invested $150 million into Theranos. Another investor included the DeVos family, which is the family of Betsy DeVos. And Betsy DeVos is the current United States Secretary of Education. The DeVos family donated $100 million. Just take it, just $100 million, it's no, no big deal. Another really well-known investor was Rupert Murdoch, who was the founder of News Corporation, which owns Fox News and the Wall Street Journal. And Mr. Murdoch, gave Theranos $125 million. $125 million, what? What? And the craziest part about all of this, all these hundreds of millions of dollars, is that the technology still didn't work. It still didn't work. This is making my lips chapped. So upsetting. So they launched at Walgreens. They created this campaign that advertised Theranos and the one drop of blood. And then they only were able to roll out the testing centers in Arizona for legal reasons. So the first Walgreens to have Theranos were in Arizona and they were a hot 
mess. When you went into the Walgreens to get a test from Theranos, you were given like a menu. It was like a this like menu of all the different kind of tests that you could take and the amount that it would cost. So it was really affordable, which a lot of people like. However, since the technology still didn't work, anytime someone went in to take a test, they were told that the test that they wanted to take would require more blood. So they had to do the traditional blood testing, which was the big old needle and the vial of blood. So they basically just become like every other blood testing company, except they were advertising that they didn't have to give that much blood. It was really strange. And people were getting very upset. They were like, wait, what? Like I thought, I thought I didn't have to do a needle and I thought I didn't have to give that much blood. Like they're like, sorry, the test that you want requires this much blood, so sorry. Essentially, they had become exactly like the other blood testing centers where they weren't being really transparent. They were straight up lying to people about what the tests were and how they were being run. And healthcare professionals couldn't get in contact with them to actually help their patients. Like someone goes and takes a test and finds out they have diabetes. So they go to a doctor and they're like, hey, I took this test. I have diabetes. And the doctor's like, oh, okay, let me see the test. Calls to try and get information on the test. No one's answering the phone. What? All right, so now we're in 2014 again. Theranos is a $9 billion company. Well, they're worth $9 billion. Elizabeth is being celebrated and rewarded as this genius philanthropist woman dropout who's changing the world. Her board of directors consisted of some of the most powerful men in the country and in the military. She met with former president Bill Clinton and vice president or potential future president Joe Biden, who both sang her praises. They were like, wow. This girl is great. She's amazing. She was getting magazine features and covers of very reputable publications. She was doing TED Talks. She was receiving awards. And the entire time, the technology still doesn't work. At this point, she's just straight up lying to people. She knows it doesn't work. Elizabeth is a liar, and you know how I feel about liars. So to the public, Theranos was this revolutionary company. Elizabeth was a genius. She was the Beethoven of our time. Anyone who met her was in complete awe of her, particularly really old, rich white men. These are just the facts. Phyllis Gardner is back at Stanford. Like, y'all are kidding me, right? Like, what the hell? What is going on? Phyllis Gardner is so confused. So to the public, Theranos has this amazing reputation, but behind closed doors, things are going to hell. Like, it is a complete an utter disaster. <laughs> the work culture at Theranos was already toxic. Elizabeth and Sunny were spying on their employees. They were watching all of their emails and being really secretive and weird had always been the culture at Theranos, but employees were noticing that they were being spied on and lied to. Not to mention, Elizabeth is getting all of this praise in the public for technology that doesn't work. So any sane person working for this company is like, okay, maybe I should get the out of here. So George Schultz, who is the former Secretary of State for the U.S., was a member of the board at Theranos and was a really big supporter of Elizabeth. George's grandson, Tyler, began working as an intern at Theranos after hearing about the company and Elizabeth from his grandfather. And after all of the events started happening, Tyler's like, yeah, this is not gonna work. I, I'm, I'm leaving, I gotta get out of here. Tyler tries to warn his grandfather, like tell his grandfather what's going on, but his grandfather doesn't believe him because he trusts Elizabeth. He's like, you don't know what you're talking about, son. I trust Elizabeth, go, just go. You wanna leave, leave, leave. And Tyler is also required to sign an NDA. All of the employees were required to sign NDAs that they wouldn't speak about anything that was happening at Theranos, and especially if they left. They were not allowed to talk to the press or tell anyone what was actually going on. Elizabeth and Sonny hired the lawyer David Bowies, who is a really high profile lawyer. He was responsible for suing Bill Gates. He represented Al Gore. He represented Harvey Weinstein. Currently, he is representing victims of Jeffrey Epstein. So he's a really high profile profile lawyer and he's very very intense anyone who left the company and would speak bad about the company would get a cease and assist from him or would get intimidated by him which is very scary so in 2014 a journalist by the name of john carry you i'm probably butchering so many names in this video i will be sure to put it on the screen anyways john is a journalist at the wall street journal and he picks up the story about theranos after getting word that an engineer who used to work at theranos or a scientist who used to work at Theranos left on really bad terms and had told people that Theranos was full of shit and that the Edison wasn't actually working. So he's like, oh my God, what? The company that everyone's revering right now is bad? Let me go, let me look into this. I'm a journalist. I'm gonna look into this. 
Mm -hmm. So John goes down to Arizona to visit a Walgreens and test Theranos for himself. And of course, he gets the, uh, oh, sorry, we have to take more blood because the test that you want requires more blood than one drop, so sorry. And he's like, well, but that's not what you're advertising. And they're like, yeah, we know, but sorry, we just have to take more blood, sorry. So John is like, okay, yeah, maybe they're full of shit. So he starts investigating even more. John continues his investigation for about a year and he gets in contact with other medical professionals who are also suspicious of Theranos. John also reaches out to ex-employees. He gets in touch with Tyler Schultz and Tyler Schultz tells him everything he knows despite having an NDA. He's like, I wanna tell the truth. So he tells the truth. And Schultz's family, his grandfather is very upset with him. They're like, why would you Why would you talk to an investigator? Like what is going on? David Boyce, the lawyer that Theranos had hired, even tries to sue Tyler like they open an investigation on him for breaking his NDA and accuse him of lying and so Tyler's family his parents have to put up their house to fight the lawsuit like they spent a lot of money trying to fight the lawsuit even though he was telling the truth so finally in October of 2015 John publishes his article in the Wall Street Journal putting out all the evidence that he found against Theranos and saying that they're frauds that they'd been lying opening up all of the stuff that had been happening behind closed doors at the company Elizabeth is furious She's like, what? The Wall Street Journal's lying. Obviously they're lying. Why would you believe this highly reputable publication? They're liars. The investors at Theranos, of course, are contacting Elizabeth and they're like, what? Tell us this is a lie. Tell us the truth. Tell us what we want to hear, Elizabeth. This isn't true, right? And Elizabeth's like, no, they're lying. The Wall Street Journal is a lie. So Elizabeth appears on the show Mad Money and talks about the claims against her in the Wall Street Journal. And she says, they made it all up. They're lying. This is what happens when you work to change things and First they think you're crazy, then they fight you, and then all of a sudden you change the world. And um, I, I have to say, I, I, I personally was shocked to see that the journal would publish something like this. This is what happens when you try to change the world. First they fight you, then they call you crazy, and then all of a sudden you change the world. Those are her words. So from this point on, it was pretty much downhill. Um, government agencies started opening investigations against Theranos because of the claims in the Wall Street Journal and they find out that it was all true. The investors start asking for their money back because what? She'd collected over $900 million. Walmart wants their money back. $900 million. She was able to get $900 million. I got some ideas too. I need to start pitching my ideas. Sure. No, I'm not a liar. I can't lie. I cannot lie. So the investors ask for their money back, of course. They want their money back. They start opening all these court cases against Sonny and Elizabeth and Theranos. And then in 2018, Sonny and Elizabeth are indicted on 11 counts of fraud and conspiracy. Fraud fraudulent liars this is the finished look i decided i'm not going to do my hair because why got this cute little ponytail the ponytail's cute enough right we're good did put on a necklace though so official so some believe that elizabeth did actually have good intentions like she wasn't a complete fraud con artist liar she actually did want to change the world and help people and this might have been the reason she was so willing to mislead and lie to people she was doing so for the greater good Duh. There are studies that show people are more willing to lie if they feel like the outcome of lying will be for a good reason. But I don't really know if that applies to Elizabeth because she lied a lot. She was a liar. People who worked with her would say she was a pathological liar, even lying about things like her voice. She would change the tone of her voice. Like in all of the speeches that she gave, she's speaking in this really deep, dark, baritone voice. I can't even do it. I can't even do it. But that wasn't actually how she talked and sometimes she would slip and not talk like that. So. I think she might have just been a liar, a con artist. She was a con artist. Today, Elizabeth is still in court over her fraud charges. If she's found guilty, she could face 20 years in prison and a $250,000 fine. She and Sunny broke up. They called it quits, I guess. <clears throat> Sorry. Elizabeth is now engaged to a man called Billy Evans and they live in a luxurious apartment in San Francisco. So she got her a new man. Thank you guys so much for watching this video. I hope that you enjoyed. As I said in the beginning, please feel free to fact check me and provide any additional information that I didn't include in this video. I really try not to make these too long. I think 30 minutes is, 30 minutes is a long time for me. Please give this video a big thumbs up if you enjoyed it. It really does help my channel out so much. And yeah, comment down below what you think. I'd love to know what you guys think, your thoughts on this just in general. Do you think she was lying? She's a complete liar or do you think she was lying for a good purpose? All right, you guys, that's all from me. I'll see you in my next one. Bye.